Well, good afternoon, Bethel Gospel Assembly. We welcome you to our afternoon broadcast, rebroadcast of what we did this morning. We hope that you will sit, listen, absorb all that transpired this morning. We welcome you again. It's going to be a blessing to you. So let's hear what thus saith the Lord in this season. Be blessed. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good morning. God bless you. Thank you for being with us here at Bethel Gospel Assembly online. Interesting times where we praise God and we give him glory. I want you all to lift your voices, open your hearts and worship with me as we bless the Lord today. The Lord is my light and salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Come on, sing with me. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. How many are going to wait on the Lord today? I will wait on you. I will trust in you. God, we trust you today. I will trust in you. I will remain confident I will see the goodness of the Lord. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. From the top, everybody. The Lord is my light and salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid? Come on. The Lord is my light and salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. I will wait on you, Lord. What else? I will trust in you. We trust you with our lives, God. We trust you for provision. I will trust in you, oh Lord. Everybody sing. I will remain. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Come on. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not faint. You won't grow weary. You're the defender. And you lift us up on wings like eagles. We set our hope on you. We set our hope on your love. We set our hope on the one who is the everlasting God. You are the everlasting God. Come on, worship God with me today. We set our hope on you. We set our hope on your love. We set our hope on the one who is the everlasting God. You are the everlasting God. Come on, one more time. We set our hope on you. We set our hope on you. We set our hope on your love. We set our hope on the one who is the everlasting God. You are the everlasting God. Yes. I will remain confident. 
But in, in this I will see the goodness of the Lord. Yes, I will, yes, I will. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Oh, yeah. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Come on, sing it. Build your faith. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Through the summer and the winter and the springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, they join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness. Your mercy and love, and there is pardon for sin, and a peace that endureth. Do you remember these verses? Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. You give strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Let's sing the chorus together. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning. New mercies I see, all I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me. We love you, Lord God. Thank you for being faithful. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for being our God, our everlasting God, our everlasting God. Lift your voice and say hallelujah to the everlasting God. 
Lift your voice and say hallelujah to the everlasting God. You don't grow faint. You don't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. We bless your mighty name. Father, we come before you this morning expressing our love and our devotion to you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our everlasting God. Thank you, God, for being our rock in a weary land, our cooling shade on the burning sand, God. Thank you for being a faithful guide for this pilgrim band. You are indeed a shelter in our time of storm. God, as we look upon the world, as we look upon our situations, it seems that the remedies come, come slowly, God, and the answers are few and far between, God. But when we look to you, we find our remedy. When we look to you, we find our hope. When we look to you, God, we find our answers. So today, God, we seek you for comfort. We seek you for instruction. We ask you, God, to invigorate us, to empower us, God, to lift up our heads, God, to build up our most holy faith, to stand upon your word and to claim every single promise you've made, understanding that you're a covenant-keeping God, that you're a loving God, that you're a care-answering God, a prayer-answering God, that you're a care and burden-bearing God, and you are indeed our everlasting God. So have your way in the service touch us and lead us in the way that we need to go. In the marvelous and matchless name of Jesus, by your spirit we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And glory to God. Please receive now, Pastor Ruth Ann Winter. Good morning, Bethel. Good morning, friends and family. We are so glad to be worshiping the Lord with you today. We pray that this truly for you is the day the Lord has made. And in spite of anything that's going on in your life, there's something within you that is determined and committed to rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to our viewing family. This is Bethel Gospel Assembly, and this is our morning worship service. We are so excited that no matter what's going on in the world, we can still stay connected to one another through this medium. So we thank God for technology, and we thank God for every single one of you. We pray that truly you are finding yourself right in the middle of God's will and feeling his presence, sustaining you and keeping you through the days that we are living in. We're going to go to the scripture right now, and I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles as Bishop Carlton Brown, our senior pastor, takes us through the word. Bishop? What a great time for us to come together at 1015 as a family of God to worship him. Um, I pray that we uh, just continue to see ourselves as that family, that we realize that we have connection in Christ, vertical, then horizontal, because he flows through you. He flows through me. And so we can come together this way. And I don't know how you you came this morning. You know, I don't know if you dressed up and got yourself ready. And that's a good idea. Um, you don't have anywhere to go, but dress up and make yourself feel good, make yourself feel comfortable. And um, and I hope that even during the week, you're doing some special things, different things, have a schedule. Don't walk around in your pajamas, you know, get, you know, flow in the day and do different things as well as continuing to join us on our prayer lines and the other uh, activities that we have on our e-church. So right now we're going to go to the word of God. On Saturday, we were we were uh, using that day included in our week of, of devotion to God, our week of prayer. And um, Saturday, we read out of Psalms chapter 82. So I wanna, want us to sojourn in that one uh, as we prepare for today. And the Bible says this, God standeth in the congregation of the right of the mighty, he judges among the gods. He, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. You know, that's how we feel right now. The very foundations of the earth seems to be out of course. And as much as we talk about this virus, you know, the, the origin of it is something to do with man, something to do with our fallen nature. And we live in a fallen world and we recognize that. But you see, this text speaks about keeping in focus your purpose. He, the Lord says this, I have said you are gods. And all of you are children of the most high. So what is he saying there? He's saying, well, you know, God created. 
whether they want to acknowledge that or not, he created the heavens, the earth, and he created you and me. And so within this creation, he created us to be like him. You are gods, he says, and you are children of the most high, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So what does he mean here? You'll die like men. Instead of us walking in the eternal bliss with him in all and for all eternity, that because of that fallen nature, because of that refusal to do that which is right, that we shall die in a manner that it was not his intention, but when we shall fall like one of the princes. And who do you think that's talking about? Isaiah, it helps us to understand a little bit when we understand he's talking about Lucifer and Jesus himself said, I saw him fall like lightning from the sky. And so we talk about falling like one of the princes, the one who had authority, but lost it in the course of following his own will and nature. So scripture ends up saying, arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And what that scripture is saying to us is that God arises in you because you love the Lord, that you serve him. He arises in me and that the, that he will judge the earth. You are the judge of the earth. You shall stand in that day and help to judge all that has happened along with our Lord and Savior and our Father. And uh, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And what does that mean? Thou shalt inherit all nations. That goes right back to number one, Abraham chapter 12, where the Lord said that through his seed, all the nations shall be blessed. So the source of blessing comes out of that relationship we can have with God. Jesus follows that up in Matthew's chapter uh, 28, uh, 18 to 20, says, go ye into all the world and preach this gospel, this good news to all people group or all nations. And so the understanding is that we have an assignment that we get to judge in the sense of those that will hear your word his word and hear his truth through your words that they can come into a place of blessing, that they come into a place of inheritance, but those that reject it shall fail. And so we're told to go and to teach them to observe all that he taught us. And he made this promise that lo, he'll be with us even unto the ends of the world and the earth. And so we realize that he is with us. It might look like the end for some people, but not us. And it isn't. I want you to know that it isn't. Whatever you're hearing, whatever you're seeing, it's not over. I want you to understand that. Let us deal with these scriptures. Uh, Pastor Ruth Ann is going to come back. She's going to tell you uh, the schedule for this week. Pastor Ruth Ann. Thank you so much, Bishop. As he said, we are going to do a bunch of praying and fasting. You thought it was just for the month of March. No, we're going to continue praying and fasting as a church. And this is exciting times. Already released to you this morning via email. And I hope that you've signed up to get your email. You already have your scripture texts for this week. As Bishop said, we this week are in the book of James. And so Monday, we're going to do James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. On Tuesday, we're going to do James chapter 1, verses 13 to 26. On Wednesday, James chapter 2. Thursday, James chapter 3. Friday, James chapter 4. And Saturday, James chapter 5. So make sure that you are in the word. We also are going to be going through some various prayer points. I'm going to review them for you quickly. As I said, they're on our website. They have been emailed to you. They've been posted on social media. So if you want these prayer points, they are all over the place. And thank you for those who said it was a little hard to read that design last week. We've made it very clear and very bright so you can read it easily. So Monday, we're still praying to stop this spread. And we need to lean into that, saints. The governor has said that we've got 21 more days, but I believe we can bombard heaven and get a different report. So we're gonna pray for stopping the spread. We're gonna pray that everyone will comply with the directives to stay at home so that we can see this crisis come to an end. And then also on Monday, we're praying for the healing of those who are sick in body or challenged emotionally, whether cancer, heart disease, respiratory issues, circulation issues, or COVID-19. We are going to be praying and believing God for healing this week. On Tuesday, we're going to pray prayers of comfort for those who are suffering losses during this time of social distancing and that his presence will sustain them. We're also going to bombard heaven for our fields on Tuesday. That's Jamaica, St. Vincent, South Africa, the Dominican Republic, India, Albania. And we're going to believe God for some of those fields that are connected to us. Liberia through the UPCAG, Romania also through the UPCAG, 
We want to pray for Harlem. We want to pray for BGGI's churches and their pastors. And we also want to pray for the UPCAG and their pastors. And frankly, we're going to pray for pastors and churches all over the world. On Wednesday, we're going to pray for our leaders, global leadership and the nation's leadership, that there would be a turning of hearts and nations towards God. That sounds like the beginning of revival to me. And then on, on Wednesday, we're also going to pray that church leaders and believers would seize opportunities to creatively meet needs, raising up a witness for Christ, that the church will prepare for a harvest of souls by presenting an authentic witness of what God has called the church to represent. While we're on that point, let me just add this. Bishop challenged us. He actually said we should do some watch parties. So right now, why don't you share this broadcast? That's a creative way to spread the gospel. Let other people know what we've got going on on service and invite them to view it with you. On Thursday, we're going to pray for first responders, even in our own church. We're going to believe God to keep them safe as they are even considering the concerns of their own family. We're going to pray for their emotional and mental health. We're going to pray that they would not surrender to fear or dread. And we're going to pray that those who don't know Christ would come to know him. And we're going to pray again on Thursday against that spirit of fear and anxiety. On Friday, we're going to pray for miraculous provision of shelter, food, finances, and jobs. I believe, I'm just crazy enough to believe that it is possible that you can get promoted in the middle of crisis. The children of God can claim that as their portion. And so we're going to believe God for you today. We're going to also pray for an elevated standard of relationship amongst the people of God. Let's be a family. Let's be together. Let's stay together and stand together. And then finally, on Saturday, April 4th, we are going to be praying for a meaningful season of embracing the truths we are about to receive during the upcoming Passion Week, even as we might be still in a season of sheltering. We can have Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, even if we are at home. And then finally, we're going to keep praying for marriages, for singles, for married couples and young people who are dealing with the stress of living at home. Now, lastly, we are still praying. We are still going to pray for um, four times a day, 6 a.m., 11 a.m., 3 p.m., and we are praying at 8 p.m. Now, here's the interesting thing. We are in position right now to stay connected all day long. So, there is a flyer that's gone out today on social media, and it tells you how you can stay connected with your BJA family. There is Sunday school at 9 a.m. for adults, for the juniors, for the preteens. There's Busy Bee going on right now. We thank God for our babies. Teen Church will be going on this afternoon. That should be 12 p.m., not 12 a.m. Shining Light and Children's Church will gather this afternoon at 2 Sunday school for the senior teams this, this afternoon. We've got a bunch of sessions Monday, Tuesday, all through the week. So there's a website, linktree slash Bethel GA. And if you go to that website, you will be able to see all of the times that you can get connected with our church family. Their phone meetings. The men's ministry is meeting tonight on the phone. The women's ministry will be meeting every first Sunday at 8 p.m. And the married couples are praying together on Tuesdays. So check out that graphic. It will help you stay connected. There is no reason that you have to be by yourself. Your family is gathering and wanting to connect with you. Now, we talked about Passion Week. It's coming up. Yes, we are going to still celebrate God's incredible sacrifice to us. So what does that mean? Next Sunday is first Sunday. And yes, we're going to have communion. So take some time this week. When you plan to come to service next Sunday at 1015, bring some grape juice and bring some crackers. And we're going to observe communion together as a family. Then also, 
I want you to make plans right now to be with us on Friday, April 10th at 7 p.m. And we're going to have Good Friday service. There will be an incredible service that we are preparing. And we want you to make plans now to invite your friends, do your watch parties. If you've got a family, come together and be together as we come into celebrating God's incredible sacrifice at Calvary. Just another reminder, our building is still um, on reduced hours, but we're open Tuesday and Thursday from 1.30 to 3.30 so that we can meet the needs of our community and you as well. So I wanna remind you, if you are in need of pantry, if you need something, if you are struggling right now, don't be ashamed. Email us, info at bethharkccc.org, info at bethharkccc.org. Or if you know somebody who's struggling, why don't you go ahead and send them that information and we will be glad to take this opportunity to reach out to them, give them an appointment and have them come up and pick pantry. Amen, pick up pantry. Come and pick, I think I said that right. All right, well, we are gonna move on in the service. I hope you're having a wonderful time. We're having a great time worshiping the Lord. Pastor Bobby happens to be one of my favorites. So he's gonna sing again. And I pray that you enjoy his worship and you should take a moment right now to go over to Givelify or go to our website or pull out your phone as long as you're not on it watching service, but go to Cash App. You can sow your tithes and your offerings. Right now, we are still meeting the needs of the community. And so every seed you sow, please understand it's going right out to help somebody and to support somebody who is in need. So again, Cash App, Bethel GA Inc., or Givelify, Bethel Gospel Assembly, or go to our website and simply click the donate button. God bless you. We're going over to Pastor Bobby now. Come on, everybody, as you give, let's worship God and thank him for everything that he's doing for us, even in this season. The song says this. God, my Savior. God, my healer. God, my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Sing it. God, my Savior. God, my healer. God, my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. God, my Savior, God, my healer, yeah, God, my deliverer, yes, he is, yes, he is, God, my Savior, God, my healer, yeah, God, my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Heavy praise is to our God. Heavy word of worship is one accord. Heavy praise, heavy praise is to our God. Whoa, whoa, sing, sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah is to our God. Heavy praise, heavy praise, heavy praise, heavy praise, heavy praise, heavy praise is to our God. Hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. Every praise is for him. And now receive our bishop, Dr. Carlton T. Brown, with the message for today. 
Who passed to Bobby? That was good. That was wonderful. And we pray that everyone has felt the the spirit move in your homes where you're at. Uh, you know, we have maybe two of you together, families together sitting. And again, the viewing parties are so important. And so we're hoping that we're just having a good time of worship and praise. And today would be a good day for you. It would be a good day, be an awesome day, a powerful day. Um, let me also say that one of the routines that we need to add is exercise. Exercise. We're fasting already. Exercise together. When you come back out, boy, people might not recognize you. So you need to just make sure that we're moving around. Don't sit there on that couch even in prayers and even in our study and all the different chat groups we'll be in, but um, movement, moving around, schedule it, keep a schedule to keep a healthy mind, to keep a healthy schedule. So schedule your day. Um, I know some of us are working from home, so, so that's, you got that work and so that's good. For those of us who are not at this time, put a schedule together that you're gonna stick to each day. This is what I plan on doing this day, when you wanna do it, how you're gonna do it, who you're gonna do it with, in terms of uh, communications um, and keep safe out there. Let us follow what the governor has issued to us. Let's follow the wisdom, um, keeping that healthy distance. Um, but remember, even though we have distance, we are not disconnected. Last week, we were talking about uh, working the sword, but keep sight of the source. I don't even know if I talked much about that title last week, but this week we're gonna understand a little bit more where that comes from to work the sword, but keep sight of the source. And this is part two. And, and uh, what we wanna talk about comes out of Psalms 23, four it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. And the key words here is my rod, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so thinking about that rod and staff, we come into Exodus chapter 17 and verse 15, um, which the staff was to play a critical part of what happens in Exodus 17, but we just for the sake of time, we're going to read just that 15th verse where it says, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with the Amalek, with Amalek from generation to generation, the promises of God. And so we want to look at that and see what does that all have to do with in terms of this sword and the staff. So let's bow our head. Lord, we thank you again for this opportunity to be in your word. We pray that you'll speak loud and clear to not only those who are viewing now, but those who will view later, and that our minds will be stayed upon you, that our minds will be sharp, that our hearts will be fixed, and that we'll move on for your honor and glory. Let the power of the Holy Ghost move through, through technology right now and into each heart, Lord, each listener, each viewer, Lord, that we will sense the hand and the goodness of the Lord. Even in these troubled times, let us sense your presence and the peace that comes with the hearts and minds that are stayed upon you, Lord Jesus. Grant us that peace, grant us that understanding. Give us that rest, give us that refidem. Give us that place, oh Lord, where we can sense the hand of God over the affairs of our lives in a time when perhaps we feel so out of control because we can't control a lot. We're being told that we have to stay indoors. We're being told we can't go to work. We're being told that there's not enough out there for us. But Lord, in the name of Jesus, I declare that your prosperity will be upon your people even in the time of lack, that Lord, we will be empowered and strengthened, Lord, that we will go forth with a bold witness to others about the power and the goodness of the Lord. Let this word, Lord, be a light in our hearts, a lamp unto our pathway, Lord. Let this word give us a sense of empowerment as we go forth in your honor and in your glory, Lord, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Lord, touching hearts and minds right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. So what we want to do real quick is just recap a little bit. Last time we talked about five elements that walks us through this portion of scripture. We talked about placement. We talked about in the place of placement, there is predicaments that we fall into, but we want to understand with each predicament, there is provision, purpose, there is purpose, 
And then along with that purpose uh, comes uh, provision and promise. Now, I, I threw purpose in there and I shouldn't have, but it's, it's uh, placement, predicament, provision, promise. All right, those four steps, purpose is coming in later. And then we finally have penalty, the last, the fifth one. We don't want to talk about that. But penalty helps you to understand something that happened when the Lord said to uh, Moses, um, and Moses declared that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And we recognize that that didn't happen. And why didn't it happen? Because God made a promise, but because of the failure of man, there was a penalty. Amen. But God ultimately overcomes. So we recognize that the placement uh, was Rephidim, that coming over the Red Sea, they came into a place called Rephidim. And Rephidim uh, speaks of a place of peace. It means peace that or, or rest. So God wanted to bring them into their rest. You came out from Egypt, you came out of burdens, you came out of sorrows, and you would come into your rest. Great, we're in rest. But immediately in chapter 17, we find out, well, wait, there's no water here. And then also later on, they had to fight these Amalekites. And so this is what you call rest. But we recognize that in the place that God calls you to, and again, because we're in a fallen world, there are predicaments there are situations and circumstances. We're all sharing one, a big one right now. But yet we're the children of God who God said, I called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. We're the children of God who testified to everybody. Oh, follow Jesus, sweet Jesus, and all this wonderful things about Jesus. But then we find ourselves jammed up. Predicaments come. The rest is established in our minds when we realize that with every predicament, God still provides. With every circumstance you're dealing with now, oh my God, the food is running out. Oh my God, I can't get out. Oh my God. But we wait upon the Lord where he renews our strength. That in waiting on God, we recognize that there's a hand that reaches down because his hand's not too short that he can't say to provide us with provision. And so we recognize that in this place, which he said, this is bitter. You call this bitter. And so the place of Meribah, uh, became known as the bitter place, but and Massa, but this place was actually called the place of proof within the midst of contention. That in your bitter times, in your predicaments, you got to prove God, even in the midst of the contention, because God will come through, and He did, and He provided water. He said, "Strike the rock," so He struck the rock, rock, and and water was provided. And then later on, we recognize that in the war, he said, okay, we're going to war against the Malachites. Now, these guys were farmers, and these guys were builders, and these guys were shepherds, and these guys, you know, they were under the yoke. Now we're supposed to be warriors. And so the idea was that the Lord said, yeah, because I'm going to provide your answer. And so we recognize further in the book of Exodus where Joshua took up the sword, and he was told by Moses that I'm going to sit up here high on the mountaintop, on the hill. And I'm going to lift up. What, what was he lifting up? He was lifting up the staff. We'll talk more about the staff a little later. And, and his hands were lifted. The staff was lifted high. And he says, as long as I'm reaching out to the Lord, you're going to find that you will prevail in the valley. While I'm reaching up to the Lord here on the mountaintop, and this is where you want to take your mountaintop experiences and help you in your valley experiences. As he was reaching up, as long as I'm connecting in my hand and going back to that portion of scripture in uh, 1715, he said, I built an altar and call the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. And so lifting up his hands was his touching the throne of God. He says, my hand lifts up upon the throne of God. And as long as my hand lifts up upon the throne of God, I will conquer my enemies. As long as I'm worshiping and praising God, I will conquer my enemies. As long as I'm lifting up my hands with clean hands and a pure heart, as Psalms 24 says, then I will conquer my enemies. The provision of the Lord is that you reach up in praise, the staff representing connection with God as you reach up into heavens and connect with him through that object of worship. In this case, they said God's presence, where is it? Right here in the staff, the same staff that he used to, to amaze the Egyptians. Same staff that the Lord told us in your hand when he first appeared to him, that same staff by which he lifted it and the waters departed, that meant the presence of God. As we reach up and maintain our worship, acknowledging that God is with us, that the sword that's in your hand, what is the sword that's in your hand? The word 
of God that's supposed to cut away the flesh. The sword of God is supposed to free the spirit of men, beginning with your own heart, your own life, the sword spoken of in the book of Hebrews, that sword and, and chapter four that talks about that uh, process of us coming boldly into the presence of the Lord because it cuts that marrow, cuts away the things that hold us down. It cuts away the disbelief in other men, the word that you use, the word, whether it's through your words, your actions, your deeds, that you're doing that which will cause men and women to ask the question, what must I be saved? Even in the midst of predicament, even in the midst of struggle and trials. And so the predicament, brought provision and provision speaks of a promise, an ultimate promise that it, to, this is not our home. We're sojourners passing through, which is pilgrims passing through. This is not our home. And we don't identify ourselves by this home. And so then finally, we, we talk about that promise of God that he has prepared a place for us. And so this is where they're heading towards that place. And so moving, that was just a wrap up. So now moving ahead, we talked just to lead us in, we talked a little bit about this um, culture of disbelief. Culture of disbelief, and we uh, read a quote from one writer who said this, do whatever you want to do religiously, but do not take it seriously. That's the culture of disbelief. Do whatever you want to do religiously, whatever practices, whatever you want to go to church with the church hat, you want to you shout and, you know, do all that. You want to remember and quote scriptures, do all that. You want to fast? Do all that. You want to try something else? Hinduism, New Age? Do all that. Just don't take it too seriously. It's what you like to do. Some people like to play chess. Some people like to play tennis. Some people like to bowl. Some people like to go to church. It's your thing. But unless we're professional bowlers or tennis players, we don't take that too serious. Don't take your faith too serious. We have bought into that so much that we have begun to identify ourselves not by our relationship with God, but by the relationship with which we have with other people, people of significance, the relationship we have with our possessions or material things, the relationship we have with our with our, our the degrees behind our names or the or the power position we have in society or who we know in society. We begin to identify ourselves by, by the level of freedom and liberty that we have within ourselves to do what we want to do with whom we want to do it with when we want to do it. And we begin to identify ourselves. And I will put it this way, we begin to lose ourselves in that. Because you see, we're running away from something deep inside. What runs deep inside is the sense that, you know what, this is not gonna last forever. What happens next? what really happens next. And this common thing we have is called the fear of death. For many of us in this season, this concept of death has been, it's been pushed in our face. Not, you know, for many of us is when a loved one dies. And some of us are, are hearing about loved ones who have passed and our hearts go out to that past because of this virus. And so we're forced to think about death and oh my God, we try to forget about it so fast that we have something called repast after the funeral. And in the repast, we joke, we laugh, and we see people we haven't seen for a long time. And part of that is a way of releasing, releasing ourselves from what could be a depressing experience into releasing ourselves. So it's, it's, it's okay, it's good. But don't release yourself so far that you forget that it's appointed unto man once to die and then a judgment. Now, the difference between us and those in the world that deal with predicaments that we deal with not only do we know how to seek for provision, but we have a sense of promise in God. So we say that death will not hold my body down. We believe that death will not hold my body down, that there's a God who loves me and a God who's going to claim me on that day. And I'm going to stand up and be with him in the name of Jesus. And so we recognize that we have a level of rest, even in the midst of predicaments. But for those who don't have that connectivity and those who want to escape the reality of the brevity of life. We identify ourselves by so many different things. And then, and then ultimately when they fail, 
And for those who try to reach out to those things, our educational pursuit, I'm, I'm looking for to live in a community that's safe. I'm, I'm looking to be free from the trappings of, of the immorality of the world. I'm looking for that safe haven and could never find it because of oppression, because of racism, because of classism, that whatever situation we find ourselves struggling to define ourselves as significant and we're denied that and that leaves us into something called a homeless mentality a sense of homelessness. Homelessness is real in our society today because there's so many have no homes. Homelessness is real to many of us because we fear that we might lose our homes. Homelessness is real to us because some of us just have no connection at all. And so we might be at home, but we feel homeless, a homeless mentality. We talked a little bit about that last time. And part of, of this losing our sense of who we are and our sense of purpose which was designed in our hearts by God, what happens is we come into a loss of identity when we identify ourselves with things that are suddenly taken away, things that we suddenly lose. Our identity is lost with that. Who am I? What's going to happen to me? That should not be the concern of someone whose mind has stayed upon him, who has a sense of identity in him. And we're able to to override this negative identification. Now we have a situation with the children of Israel, children of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but after 400 years, they've forgotten that, especially in the midst of their predicaments, in their sorrow, in their suffering. What has he done for me lately? As I preached a couple of weeks ago. And so we forget and they forgot who they were. So they begin to re-identify with the negative concepts and thoughts and mindset of their oppressor. So they saw themselves, they begin to identify with hardship, begin to see their identity as being slaves. They begin to see their identity as one who's always trying to come up higher, but never can. There's a, a ceiling over you, brother. You'll never be more than what you are. They begin to buy into that and they were willing to just, if you could just give us a little straw, then it'll help us to be brick builders. You weren't called to be brick builders. You were called to come into a promised land. You were called into greatness, man. You were created to be a, 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 a sign to the world. You were created to be examples of a God that loves and keeps his people so that you can influence others to follow you and not you follow them. But you see, because of those years of suffering, because a Pharaoh came up, a king came up who didn't know anything about Joseph and began to cause him to suffer because he saw the prosperity among them. He tried to destroy, destroy their manhood destroy their sense of identity and cause them to re-identify themselves as less than. And in this time of your suffering, the enemy is going to try and do a head trip on you to make you to identify with everything that's lost. And if you have lost things right now, then you are lost. That's the thinking that he wants you to have. That's the mindset he wants you to have. This homeless mind exists in conditions where there might be a home but there's a sense of helplessness due to poverty, racism, advanced age that leads to a sense of isolation and abandonment. We come into a place where there's a neglect among our youth because of broken family systems that cause them to feel, who am I? They don't want to identify with you, but who am I? That makes them susceptible to gang violence and, and gang activities and, and other groups that aren't up to anything good because they're also trying to define who they are social systems that marginalize based on class and economic, economic status, all because quite simply, we become homeless. Or what I mean by there is that we have lost our identity. So we're in a crisis of identity right now for many people. Your identity is being challenged. There was this, um, a, a CNN news cameraman who, who got a request approved to to do a job. And so he, he used his cell phone to call the local airport to charter a flight. And he was told that a twin engine plane would be waiting for him on the runway. So he arrived at the airfield. He spotted a plane warming up outside a hangar. So he jumped in with his bag, slammed the door shut and shouted, let's go. The pilot taxied out, swung the plane into the wind and took off. So once in the air, the cameraman instructed him, oh, you see that valley over there? I want you to swoop in real close and I want to get a shot of that. I want to just move in close. And the guy said, get a shot of what? What are you talking about? He says, well, I'm a cameraman for CNN and I need to get a shot of that. And so I need to get you to get me closer. 
So the pilot was strangely quiet for a moment. And then finally he said, um, so what you're telling me is you are not my flight instructor? <laughs> I can't hear you laughing, laugh a little louder for me. Mistaken identity, mistaken identity. Now I imagine somehow they found their way back to the airport because the story ends there. So they made it back safe. But the point is sometimes we're going on flights in life and we are doing it on the basis of a mistaken identity. This text is about us coming back into a proper identification with our maker, with our, with our sovereign God. And so moving from the placement, the predicament, the purpose and promise, there's a penalty that we want to avoid, the penalty of loss. Penalty that the children of Israel lost, the story of the Amalekites is that later on underneath the command of Saul, when they were supposed to defeat generation after generation, he gave them a gift of life because the people wanted to. The people wanted the produce, the people wanted the spoils of war, the people. And so because of what the people wanted, Saul failed to stand up against them. And so in, in 1 Samuel, I believe, chapter 15, we find that because he failed, the Lord gave him a word that you have failed me. And so you have lost, the kingdom is lost to you. And this was the entree into David's rule. The penalty, the penalty. We want to maintain, unlike Saul, our identity. And whatever you're dealing with, you want to maintain your identity. And understand in the world that we live in, everything around us is designed to strip you of that, that identity with the Lord. Classic story that comes out of the book of Daniel where it talks about the three, Hebrew, uh, the three Hebrew boys in Daniel, of course, and how these men were all had different names. That we had Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Assyria. And all these names, Asariah, and all these names were biblical. Daniel means God is my judge. Jehovah, uh, Hananiah is Jehovah is gracious. M Mishael, who belongs to God? Azariah, Jehovah helps. And now these young men were taken into exile because of the failure of Israel. They were, and, and the people of God that and Judah in this case, that they were all taken into exile, which would be for 70 years. But God said, I make a promise to you. You're going through a penalty season, but I'm gonna bring you out. But while there, we recognize that the Babylonian, their captors said, all right, here's what we're gonna do. And the chief official of Babylon gave them new names. Daniel became Belshazzar. Hananiah became Shadrach. Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. Each name represented their gods. Belshazzar, Bel protects his life. And Shadrach and Meshach names that they're not sure what they mean, but they seem to be associated with the God of Mad, uh, uh, Mad Duke, Marduk. And then finally, we have Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, servant of Nebo. And what we see is the enemy's attempt to help you to realign your identification according to their standards and according to their values. But we know the story of Daniel. Daniel said, okay, they, they can change our names, but they're not gonna change the word inside of us. And when they tried to feed them that which builds the flesh and builds the life, feed them, oh, scrumptious stuff in Babylon. I said, no, we're gonna to stick to what we know to be eaten because of what we learned in our time in Israel, in our time among our people. And so we will prove that we will look better than anyone else if you just let us have our own diet. So they did that and indeed they did. And God continued to sustain them. And we know the story of the three Hebrew boys and the refusal to bow. Under no circumstances will we give up our identity with our God. Daniel, who would pray with the windows open, and they tried to destroy him, but he says, I will not surrender. You can take my name, but you're not gonna take my identity. So, so we should stand, understanding that we have a responsibility to stand up in the identity that God has given us, including this season right now. Don't let the circumstances and predicament you are in define who you are. It is a desperate time, not gonna lie to you. There are hardships, not gonna lie to you. But in the midst of that predicament, there are the provisions of God. Prove him, 
in the midst of contention. And so what we're called to do is to basically, and what Moses was doing with them after 400 years in Egypt and bring out a people with the slave mentality and a poverty mentality, what God had commissioned Moses to do was to help them to redefine themselves according to his values. And so the first thing that Moses was doing was number one, rebuilding their identity. Moses' assignment within the crisis was to restore connection between the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the covenant promise that he made in Exodus chapter six, verse two, where he said, God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. What he's saying here is that I appeared to them as El Shaddai, the sovereign one, the all sufficient one. I appeared to them in that way. But one way I did not appear to them was as Jehovah, as Jehovah, the God who is with them, the all powerful God who now chooses to walk in close relationship with them. So here we recognize that Moses was saying, you need to understand who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and is, and that he's a God that's now in the midst, the all powerful God, the one who called himself into existence. And as a result of calling himself into, resist into existence, he can call you into a new existence because there is no ceiling to him. First step, identity, was to rebuilding their identity. And in this step that you're in right now, it's time for you to re-identify, to reconnect with who you are and who you serve and the God who's called you out, the, the one who called himself into existence and now confers this relationship with you. Secondly, it was the restoration and reinforcement of purpose. To reach the promised land that represents the place and affirmation of the relationship with their God, he said this, Exodus 6, 4, 8, he says, I also established my covenant with them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them the land of Canaan. And further on in the 8th verse, he says, and I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession because I am the Lord, because Jehovah said so. So there's a promise to bring them into their place of rest, into their place of provision, the promised place. And in that generation, in that time, land meant everything. All wars was about land and territory. Now all war is about money and dollars. Land is a means by which we can have the money and the dollars to control. Land was everything. If you had land, you were somebody. And he says, I have a place that I prepared for you. And Jesus says this, that I have a place I prepared for you and that I receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. There's a place prepared, a promised place. And he said, where I am, there you may be also. Some of us think heaven is your goal. No, it's not heaven. Where I am, there you may be also. Where he is, that he's coming back and he's going to come back triumphant. And in the final battle, there will be an overcoming of everything that's contrary to the spirit and the reality of God. And he says, where I am, there you'll be also. When I set up and establish my eternal kingdom, there you will be also. That's the land you're looking for. But as a type, to help them to grow into that deeper theological understanding, the land, the promised land of milk and honey. Don't think your milk and honey is heaven. He's got more plans for you. That's just a stopping ground for that which is greater and that which is to come. So he needed to help them to understand not only who they were, but also understand their purpose. Your purpose is to get into a promised place and ultimately to bring others with you. Because as I bless you, all the nations will be, will be blessed. As I bless you, others are going to come to understand who I am. The purpose and the promise comes together. That in giving you the promise, you are fulfilling your purpose, which is to draw all men unto me. Then the third thing is that he wanted, Moses wanted to bring them into, was not only identity and not only an understanding of their purpose, but also the indoctrination of core values that helps to shape the recognized expressions of the people chosen by God, the, the core values. What are you supposed to look like in this journey? 
Who are you supposed to be identified as in this journey? Exodus 6, 7, the Lord says, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. What is he talking about? He's talking about to come into a place of intimate knowledge. I call you to be my people. My people most directly would be my children, my son and daughter. And in creating them or procreating, there's an expectation that they will understand the standards of what it means to be a Brown. Especially when you have tried to seek the, the core values of God and you say, well, this is what we're trying to achieve, this relationship with God. It becomes important for every godly parent to want to impart what it means to be you, but not you per se, not your last name, whether it be, it be Hicks or whether it be Winter. But it's about becoming that which you live for, you strive for, which you have identified yourself with, with my God. So to be uh, brown means to reflect God to reflect those core values of God. And so the time we spend in bringing them to a certain point of an age of accountability and understanding has been pouring into them certain core values. So the certain things Browns don't do, we don't steal, we don't rob, we don't cheat, we don't lie, we don't, those core values, we worship God, we serve God, we pray, we give uh, acts of kindness to others. The, the core values that come out of this identification we have with God leads us into a place of expressing something that looks like him, that acts like him. This is what uh, the core values is what um, Moses immediately began to do. And later on, there had to be the adoption. Once you begin to be indoctrinated with the core values, the next point is that there is an adoption of those shared practices. There's an adoption of shared practices. Exodus 15, 26 says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, then I will put none of the diseases on you, the penalties that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. I am the Lord, your heal. And what he's talking about is practices within the community. Practices within the community. How we engage each other, how we engage the world. Adoptions of shared practice. And part of what God is doing in the season that we're in is refining us, working on us. I talked about it last year that we had to go to another level. One of the things I said, we're going to another level in prayer. <laughs> Look at us. I said, we got to go into another level of how we treat the community. Even though we, we have Beth Hark and we do all these good works. But, but in order for us to impact the community or the world, there's got to be another level, how we treat each other. How we treat each other. Those are the things that God impressed in my heart for the last year and a half. And if you listen to the messages, that's what I've been pouring out. And now it's testing time testing time. We heard the word, we said yay and amen, but did we walk away from it? Did we just say, well, in the pantheon of preachers, this is where I would put this message or preaching, I would put this. Did we, did we do that or did we really begin to allow the word to saturate us? It's testing time. You say, well, how much can I do with other people? Well, <laughs> that's temporary. It's temporary. Like I said, this is not the new normal. It's temporary. But when we come out, there's going to be a whole lot of shifting. There's going to be a whole lot of needs. Not just in the world and your neighbors, in our own body. Where God declared that in the predicament, I have provision. Guess what? Guess what? God says, I got provision. I got water. In your place of contention, there is approving. Okay, so where's my provision? And we look up to the heavens and the hills and wait for it to come down. So the Lord said, I'm not going to bring it down that way. That's miracle stuff. Miracle stuff that becomes every day is no longer a miracle. Miracle stuff means those extraordinary times when I do a supernatural revelation for the sake of you understanding that I'm with you. And now on the sake of, under, by, this, by the reality that I'm with you, now I, 
I'm asking you to operate differently because now you know you got backup. So there's a certain boldness you have. There's a certain liberty you have. There's a certain uh, uh, compassion you have to and generosity to give. And so some of us who have a lot are going to have to begin to give that to help somebody else. And they'll praise God because provision came in their predicament. Are you, are you seeing what I'm saying? That because we know that God provides, we're able to continue to be a people of promise and operate like we know we got backup. When we come out of this, there has to be a new standard of relating to one another where some of those, those things that disturb us and, and you know little thorns in our side and, and I don't like that attitude and I don't like this one and some of those attitudes got to change. But you know what? You're going to be the one to help them change it. It's going to help them change it by how you interact with them, by how open they are now because they're looking for the provision of God and God says, you're the one. You're the one the one they were talking about, the one they were tearing down, the one they were trying to destroy, not really meaning to be that malicious and that dangerous, but they just, you know, people. We don't think, oh, I don't really mean it, but you hurt me. I didn't mean it like that, but you did. But now, because God is my provider and God has spoken to me because I'm open to him, I bring this gift to you. And I do it with a smile, not a smile of superiority or advantage, but a sense of, 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 I'm really interested in investing in you. Out of this predicament we're in, new lines of communication, new lines of relationship are about to be forged. Because the stronger you begin to allow God to, to help you to refocus on who you really are, coming out of that Egyptian mentality, that slave mentality and coming to the fullness of the liberty that God has given you. And now, because we got that mindset, I can go through my predicaments because I know that there's provision. I know that there's promise. I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight. And because I have re-identified myself with him, I've now uh, had a reinforcement of his purpose. And so now I, I, I remember or I relearn or I, I'm holding on to what are the core values of my faith what am I supposed to look like? What does Romans chapter 12 tell me and how to deal with my enemies and how to deal with other people? What does the scripture tell me about my interpersonal relationships, these core values, because he forgave me. He came from heaven to earth. He has uh, suffered and died and rose again. He takes me in spite of my faults and sins and he brings me up higher because I'm washed in the blood and I want to grow closer to my savior. And as a result of that, I want to be more like him. I want to be more like him. I want to be more like him. And God says, don't show it to me, show it to them. Show it to them. So we adopt shared practices. That's not just some of us, not just the ministers, not just the deacons that have to show that level of, of care and kindness, but it's for all of us because the Bible says all of us are ministers. All of us are ministers. And then finally, we have the establishing of traditions. That's what Moses did. Moses took them to re-identify themselves, to rebuild their identity, to restore or reinforce their sense of purpose, to be indoctrinated with the core values, to establish traditions, uh, 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 shared practices, um, to come into a place of shared practices. And of course, later on, he had the law and define everything that's supposed to do. And then finally, last one is the establishment of traditions that will trace and make celebratory the identifying of the people, what they have inherited from God, the traditions we do that helps us to identify as a group and know what we have inherited and to rehearse it, to celebrate what we inherited from our progenitor. Regarding the Passover, which is one of the first ones, and as Pastor Ruth Ann talked about, we're going to, you know, even in our separation, we're going to celebrate the Passover. Exodus chapter 12, 14 says, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. And later on in Exodus 13, 3, he says, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord God did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be for you a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes, 
that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statue as it is appointed time from year to year. And so there are certain things that we, we do celebrate in our tradition, but we do not make gods out of tradition. And what I mean by that, God gives us a word, baptism, the sharing of broken bread. He makes it a part of our practice that we do on a regular basis. Fasting and praying, these are traditions that we have. Certain um, uh, days that we recognize um, Christmas is not a tradition that comes out of the word of God, but that's something we have taken on because it's a good tradition. It's one that says we remember the birth of our savior and we wanna hold on to that. And so we have created Christmas as a great time of, of coming together and rallying. Thanksgiving in America has become that time of rallying together, not so much because we identify maybe with the pilgrims, but we identify with the fact that there's a God who does provide and that there should be a time of sharing with others. So we have adopted certain traditions, but other traditions are not healthy for the body. Traditions about, well, you know, we do service just this way, or we have just these people pray, or the piano has to be in that corner and the drums have to be over there. Or in our traditions, we have no drum, drums. In our traditions that uh, we have, uh, the men can only wear ties or, or we don't wear ties or, or women have to do this or that. We, we create all kinds of traditions that will actually put people's nose out of joint because they don't follow that tradition. And because they don't follow that tradition, then we begin to ostracize and we begin to separate and we begin to say things and we begin to see a, 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 a disconnect in the body. There are traditions that are of God and every tradition that the church has should be something that puts God above everything else. And to put God above everything else means that in that tradition, there's a reflection of his love, his holiness, and his accessibility to all. His love, his holiness, and his accessibility to all. Any traditions that we create that denies that reality of God is not a godly tradition. In our time of separation, tradition becomes important because it helps us to remember how we are connected not only to God, but to each other. They said this after the, the, the judgment of God, again, the penalty because of their failure to, to, to hold on to what God told them to do, that, that, you know, Jews, we all know how they were scattered all over. And scriptures talk about that there'll be a great scatter, scattering, that there'll be a great scattering. The beauty of what's happening in Israel, though we might have issues with the, uh, their, 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 uh, some of what they do, um, government, and, and that um, some of it is not acceptable, it's not of God, but yet God put a favor on them. They're suffering. There's judgment, but ultimately spiritual Israel will be saved that there's a remnant that will come out and God is going to do a work with them. And so we're not talking about political Israel, we're talking about spiritual Israel. But here's the thing, that when they begin to come back into their own place after they've been scattered, and as I said so many different times, you can't find a Hittite, you can't find an Amorite, you can't find any of those ites in biblical time. But it's so strange that you can find the Israelites. And though they were scattered, like everybody else was scattered, they found that when they began to come back into the land in the 1900s, as they began to come back from Russia, from different places in Europe, different places in India, as they began to come back from America, they found that they all still worship the same way. They found that they kept the same sacraments they commemorated the same thing. And, and it's amazing. So after, after almost 2000 years of separation, it's amazing that we would still be in agreement because they kept those traditions alive. And they kept alive those traditions that spoke to the core value of what God expected of them as a people. And so as a result of that, they were able to maintain their identity. We're kind of scattered right now wonder if we can maintain our identity, our commitment, our core values, our shared practices. One of the ways we do it is by our traditions. That's why we're going to make sure we celebrate in a special way, celebrate in a special way the, the uh, communion, the Passover, and do be a part of that. And so you stay with us and 
you'll hear more about it. I'm going long, so let me let me try to bring this to a close. But I do want to do something special with you. I want to share something special that came from my sister Kyoko. But before I get there, let me just say this word about the staff. We need to recognize that God has a power that prevails. And as I said before, whatever sword we're use, using to maintain our stand and to press forward and to share the love of God, let's keep worship alive, the staff. And the staff, I said before, represents the authoritative and traceable presence of God among the people of God, that it was used for the liberation from Israel, uh, from Egypt. It was a lead character in this regard. It was there at the burning bush in Genesis chapter in uh, Exodus chapter four, verse two to four. It was there um, in terms of how he revealed himself to the elders of the church to verify the authenticity of his mission in chapter four, verse 30. We recognize that in the confrontation with Pharaoh, it was prominent there. And so we recognize the staff represents the abiding presence and power of God in the midst of all that they would experience on their road to promise. And we recognize this, I want you to see this, that this same presence is found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his power to pull us together and to sustain us as a community of believers. He said, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth, and now you go and disciple all people group. Jesus becomes that which is lifted up high. On the cross in Golgotha, we recognize it was Jesus on the cross that if you look at that, it could be seen as a kind of staff and it represented this connection that God was establishing between him and all the peoples of the earth. And everyone that will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved. Everyone that calls upon the name of Jesus Christ comes into his promise, can come into their rest. And as we lift up Jesus, be, before we want to preach our first sermon, before you want to serve your first meal, before you want to, to prove yourself to be a child of God and an instrument of his righteousness, a sword in the hand of God, before you lift up the sword, lift up your hands and take hold of the supernatural eternal staff, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to take hold of Jesus is to touch the throne of God and to touch the throne of God as the scripture tells us in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, is to take hold of the throne of God, take home and hold of the promises of God. That from generation to generation, your enemy, the one that's trying to take off your head, Amalekite means the head ringers, the ones who twist a head off. And the enemy's trying to twist your head off. You got stuff happening. He's trying to twist your head off. But can you keep praising him? Can you keep worshiping him? Can you keep your hands on that throne? Not with the physical staff, but with that which is symbolic of that staff, but now comes and dwells among us, walked among us, revealed himself to us, who said that after three days, I will rise again, and he did. And the one who said, I'm coming back to take you with me, can we hold on to that truth that's in Jesus Christ and know that he's able to establish what needs to be done, no matter what your circumstances are today. The apostle Dr. Abraham Fenton said to me, every crisis produces heroes. Be the one, be the one, be the one. As a loving, learning, launching and liberating community, be the one in your identity, be the one in your purpose, be the one in your core values and in your shared practices. Be the one as you hold to traditions that cause others to say, why do you do this? And we can tell them the story of how Jesus brought us over and how Jesus brought us out. I want to close with this just before we pray. Uh, we have a sister, she's Japanese, a sister Kyoko. And she, um, Kyoko, um, has been establishing a work. She has about 80, 90 people online, a, a kind of online church. Japan is a nation that has maybe 1% Christians. They were taught years and years ago that Christianity was a, Christ, was a religion of death. And so they're really afraid of Christianity, but they're curious people, they're curious about our faith. So online, she's been able to communicate and do different things. And people are have been encouraged sometimes as my messages that she'll redo and give them the principles and, and they've been loving it and, and uh, different phrases and 
different things we do. She she was uh, Bobby, our pastor Bobby was with her recently again and, and doing a gospel tour and it was very blessed time. Um, she does a lot of works with groups coming over. She does a lot of works and, and uh, with all, also her Christian ministry. Um, but things have been rough for her. Things have been rough as we can understand. So I want, she wrote me something and I wanna read most of it to you right now, real quick and, and show you what happens when we have identity that's established when we know and understand our purpose and understand also the core values and understand also the shared practices. And I wanna share how this has taken a woman who's basically here, her son is up in Massachusetts. She's really here alone. Her family's back in Japan. And she's been here for 15, 20 years, but, but here's, here's what she said. Um, she wrote to me, uh, Carlton Son, Carlton Son. Hope all is well with you and your family. I heard that horrible murder case happened last night in Harlem. She just sent this yesterday, 128th Street and 3rd Avenue. And lately, so many discrimination cases to Asians. People are getting crazy because of stress. Probably, I am scared of people more than virus. But still, God is here. Let me share good thing. I posted my message to Facebook friend in Japan yesterday on Facebook. And because so many people contacted me and asked me, are you okay? So I was tired to answer laugh out loud. But my post was touched to so many people and keep sharing in Japanese Facebook. I was surprised this morning and it, and it took all day to make comment for all. And one of the Japanese Christian newspapers found it and asked me that they want to put my Facebook post on their newspaper. Here is my post with Google translation. It might sound a little strange. I mentioned about love, quote unquote, love your neighbor out of the Bible. And they loved it. I believe Japanese want to hear the word of God, but they are just afraid to believe particular religion. So she writes, to all my Facebook friends in Japan, thank you so very much for sending me the message. Are you okay in New York? As my appreciation to all of you, I would like to share my latest days in New York life and my thoughts. New York is in a very difficult situation. And as of March 27, she gives a number of infected people and number of fatalities. She says, the New Yorkers avoid going out and stay home. The reason was that we knew how dangerous the corona was. At first, I didn't know the danger at all. And I took, I looked lightly like some president saying, it is just a cold. I think many Americans thought so. However, as time goes on and we know what the virus is, our attitude changes. And it was a very big change. But the United States was amazing, I thought, was that the decision was made in all in an instant to say, we'll think about money for the time being, but let's give priority to protecting lives now. A few days later, when it was decided to close a restaurant or a bar, I heard some customers left more chips than usual, that the expectation that waiters will lose their job if the store closes. When the line was set up at the supermarket, I heard many stories about giving priority to the elderly. In other words, the people of this country usually look self first compared to the Japanese. But when such an emergency occurs, it is natural to cooperate with each other naturally. And a true humanistic nationality is coming out. Of course, it's not just a beautiful story. It's also true that the repeated mention of the coronavirus by the Chinese virus, as the Chinese virus by the US president has heightened prejudice against Asians. Asians who have been blatantly yelled at, blamed for Chinese, uh, put on a mask, they're assaulted or blatantly avoided on the train, they are forced to be alone. However, as soon as that happened, one nonprofit organization started researching Asia discrimination on Corona. And the Attorney General of New York launched a hotline to accept voices of Asian discrimination. And after all, there was a feeling that America, American cannot ignore it is if there is a person who is in trouble. Let me say that line again. After all, there is a feeling that American cannot ignore it if there is a person who is in trouble. Isn't that because Americans have basically the same moral values? The moral philosophy comes from the world's best-selling Bible, the Bible that says, love your neighbor, and that cannot be ignored. And what she's talking about is that the principle of our nation was established on biblical principles, core values, and shared practices. We're losing sight of that. But in some ways, this 
predicament. It's causing us to look and think differently. So she continues, my work was canceled one after another. My earnings outlook was lost. I should be wondering what to do, but it's strange that I sleep well at night and don't feel much anxious. I think it's because I feel that there is love around me. Police in my neighborhood always patrol that everyone follows the rules of social distancing, that they'd be trouble free or anyone falling down in the street that they would be there for them. The mayor and the governor meet every day to inform the citizens of the latest information. New York City provides meals to children every day because the school is closed, because they cannot go to work. They have also decided to subsidize their income and there are recommendations that those who need it can lend money without interest or that they should not be kicked out even if they are not paying rent or utilities. And many other things are happening. Our church is closed, but still we provide food and clothing only twice a week for two and three hours, but we still provide. And because of the situation, many Americans are posting more than criticism on social media saying, everyone is okay. Let's do our best. Let's go get over this together. At first I was worried that a riot would occur, but the Americans were much more mature than I had imagined. Love your neighbor is not giving or receiving alms because someone does it. I don't feel lazy like doing nothing. When I am in trouble, when someone is tough, someone should be able to help me. So when I can do it, I have something, I have to do something that I too can go forth and love my neighbor. When we're in crisis situation, what comes out of man must be love, not hate or suffering. And even in a difficult situation, you can find something good like, oh, the sky is blue today, or I can hear the birds and be grateful. I wonder if there is a human way of life. I also try to clean places that I do not usually do repair broken shelves, clean up closets, do other things I could not do before. When I found a letter from someone who I did not contact for a long time, I sent her a message, how are you doing? Considering the future, it may be difficult. However, God seems to teach modern people that if you do not change the way of life and work, the earth will be destroyed as it is. Once all humanity may have had to reconsider the current social life, and what she means is that then we can consider how to get closer to the teachings of the word of God and reflect him. In Japan, the spread of infection may begin. According to information from returnees to Japan during the past few days, measures to prevent infection at Japanese airports have been too easy and surprising. We pray that we will be well prepared and cooperate with each other in the, preve uh, the prevention and spread of infection and that love your neighbor will spread in Japan. I thank God for this honest, open reflection of one of our own, one of our members, Kyoko, who's from Japan, how she's going through this, her own reflections on what's happening, her own resolve that comes with a confidence that there's a promised place that God has for her, as long as she holds on to that throne of God. Hand on the throne, the other hand on the sword, making the name of the Lord great in all the earth. I thank you for the time that you spent with us this morning. I gave you a lot. You can review it again later on in your YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel, or on Facebook. Take this and eat it. Absorb the principles that are there. Rehearse it in your mind. God, God will not forsake you, he will not leave you. God has a plan for your life. So walk in that confidence, of how you identify with him. So whether you're in a predicament, know that there's provision, know that he's made a promise. Don't lose sight of that. There's penalty when we do, but hold on to his unchanging hand. Bow your heads with me. Lord, I. Thank you for this chance of us to rehearse our identification with you. Lord, our sense of purpose. Lord, the core values that we're to have as believers that we reinforce by study of your word, taking counsel together, shared practices, those opportunities that we can demonstrate the love of God. And Lord, we thank you for those traditions that keep us bound together even as we're coming to a, one of our greatest traditions, which is 
commemorating the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would, we would be strong in our faith, but also remember that we have a witness that must be shared for your honor and glory. With every head bowed and eye closed, I want to pray for somebody here who might have viewed this without a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God loves you. The promises we spoke about in this message, they're yours. They're yours. Going back to Psalms 82, what we read earlier, you're a part of that promise. You were called to be like him, God's. Don't die as a man. Know that you're a child of God. Claim your place. Claim your place. And how we do that, the Lord made a way because of our tendency to fail. The Lord made a way through the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever believes on him, for he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved by a confession of our faith in our heart to believe that he is risen from the dead, making that confession with our mouth that he is Lord. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you call upon the name of the Lord today, you can come into that loving relationship with him. And then we want to hear about it. And you can reach us online and just uh, uh, send us a uh, send me a, a word through uh, senior pastor at Bethel Gospel Assembly. Uh, just go online, BethelGA.org, and, and you can get all that information and reach out to us. But right now, I want to pray for you that you would make this call on your life a reality because he's calling. He's calling. And he's waiting to hear you say, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to have the peace of God. I want to be like him. And so, Lord, we pray right now for those on the line who would even receive you as Savior right now. We pray that they would come into that understanding of who you are and say, yes, yes, yes. Lord, it's not about how good we are, how great we are. It's not about what we can do for ourselves. But there's a work of the Holy Spirit work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to bring about the transformation based on the word that is in our life. And that life in our lives and that word is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by him. So bless them and bring them into the fullness of who they really are in the Lord. We bless each of us, the provisions, we continue to come against fear, doubt. As Kyoko says, she's sleeping in spite of the fact that nothing's coming in. How is she able to do that? She fully identifies with the God who's called us into our rest, placed us there. But it's a God that says, in the midst of your predicament, I will provide. I will provide. So bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name. And may all God's people say, Amen. That's about Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living 
bless you. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. We truly pray that you have been blessed and that you've gleaned something that you will carry with you through the week. We look forward to praying with you tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. on the prayer line and then again at 11 and 3 and 8. For our young people, feel free to jump on one of the Zoom calls today and men gather tonight for prayer. And then we'll see you right back here again on Facebook and YouTube this Wednesday at 7 p.m. God bless you, Bethel. And as we always used to say, have a fantastic day in the Lord.